Good afternoon and welcome to today's webinar, How AI and Machine Learning Will Impact Paid Advertising, brought to you today by Equizio and Hannapin Marketing. Joining us today is Mark Poirier. He's the founder and CEO of Equizio, and he's been named one of the top 25 most influential PPC experts. So it's a real treat to have Mark today. I think he's going to share some great insights. Mark, welcome back. Hey, thanks for having me. I got to say that the that, uh, top 25 influential PPC experts was a while ago. I should have chosen a, a different bullet. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I'm glad to be here. That's okay. We're going to keep it our secret. So uh, you're still really influential, and that's all that that's all that matters. <laughs> and my name is Jeff Baum. I'm the director of services at, Han at Hannapin Marketing. So we're looking forward to bringing you some great content today. So who is Hannapin? So Hannapin runs the world's most popular PPC blog, PPC Hero, and the largest PPC conference, HeroConf. We manage and optimize global paid search, social, and display programs. And typically, our, our clients, their brands within 12 months, see about a 250% increase in their growth trajectory. We have a whole range of clients uh, from uh, some of the largest brands and recognizable ones to very small ones. So just as some of the sampling of our clients are clients like the Weather Channel, uh, Highlights, Shoe Carnival, Franklin. So we service a whole range of clients. And Mark will speak a little bit about Aquizio. Sure. So quickly, we're uh, Aquizio is based out of uh, Montreal, Canada. We're uh, uh, one of the leading uh, companies in uh, paid search management and Facebook optimization. Uh, we're uh, the first, uh, I think, so software as a service company to use advanced machine learning technology and to apply it to paid advertising to control uh, things like bids and budgets. We've been doing this for more than five years now. Um, we manage a large number of campaigns. We make a lot of adjustments every day because, of course, we can. It's technology, so we can do this. And uh, the effect generally is uh, increased lifetime. So customers, uh, we work with agencies and resellers, right? So their customers will stay on board about 30% longer. Uh, and uh, the uh, campaign managers spend less time doing things that should be given to uh, technology or robots. That's it. Great. Thanks, Mark. I appreciate hearing a little bit more about Aquizio. Uh, we would love for you in the audience to join the conversation along with us. So if you have any questions, uh, include the hashtag ThinkPPC if you're sending us any questions through Twitter, or use the webinar question box to shoot us over any questions we have. We'll answer your questions at the end of the webinar. So now it's time for our first live poll question. So the question today is, how long have you been in PPC? Have you been in PPC less than one year, one to three years, three to five years, or five or more years? So Mark, uh, how long have you been in PPC now? Oh boy, uh, just for 14 years. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm right behind you. I'm at about 13 years. Uh, I pretty much started when Edward started. So, uh, you know, I know I say it often, but I remember the days when it was just quick through rate and that was the metric. Yeah, of course. So we have our poll results in and we have a, a pretty decent split. We have 19% of you that have been in PPC less than a year. Uh, we have 37% that have been in PPC one to three years, 15% in that mid-range of three to five years, and 28% of you have been in PPC for five years or, or more now. So with that, I'll turn it over to Mark. All right. So maybe the first thing I want to do is uh, just a quick set of uh, definitions or explanations between uh, what are the differences between artificial intelligence, uh, machine learning, deep learning. Um, so starting with artificial intelligence, you can think of these things as an evolution, even though they're still alive today, of course, but the uh, artificial intelligence has been the idea 
uh, is that computers or machines can exhibit intelligence like humans. And this concept's been around for many years, for probably 60 or 70 years, from the 50s on. And uh, many people are familiar with Turing stats, which is still valid today. The idea is to uh, send communications and uh, to establish communication between a computer and a human and to, uh, to be unable to see whether or not it's a computer you're talking to would be a, a positive test of the uh, Turing uh, test. So it was positive outcome. So it's still valid today, like computers, uh, AI is still something that exists and uh, it evolved uh, over the years. You know, there were many years where there's very little progress but starting in the 80s, I would say, uh, until maybe 2010, was maybe the, uh, the years where machine learning uh, became more popular. Uh, machine learning are uh, typically algorithms that process data uh, to learn something about the world, I guess. So uh, you have algorithms like decision tree learning, random forest trees, uh, inductive logic programming, clustering, uh, reinforcement learning, uh, Bayesian networks. So there's many, many, many different types of algorithms that fit in that category. And uh, this, is, this is where we do our work today. Uh, a lot of the work we do revolve around building sets of algorithms to resolve problems based on the data we have from our customers. So this is uh, data on campaign performance, obviously and uh, how it can be impacted by modifying specific variables. And then you have the evolution of machine learning, which is uh, something that's been uh, pioneered, I'm very proud to say, a lot of it has been pioneered in Canada, Montreal, and Toronto. Uh, deep learning are uh, also known as uh, neural networks, neural nets. Uh, these are, I guess, un inspired by, you know, our understanding of the biology of brain, of the brain, and uh, how neurons interconnect to, 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 uh, together to process data and process information. Uh, so, for example, uh, applications of neural networks uh, uh, revolve around image recognition and uh, uh, speech recognition. So if you imagine um, uh, a great example, actually, is something that was done uh, by a scientist, I forgot his name now, but he, he uh, wanted to, to recognize the image of a cat in YouTube videos, right? And to do that, uh, the, uh, the, the process that we use is to chop up uh, images uh, into like uh, tiny little tiles, like many tiny little tiles that are analyzed by a first layer uh, that would do its job to try to determine whether or not this is a cat. What I'm looking at this image is it contain a cat somewhere. Uh, and sometimes maybe the, uh, that layer is specialized at looking at the color hues or the edges or looking for specific things like eyes or ears or a tail or uh, looking at the fur, looking for fur, looking for um, uh, movement. It could be looking for uh, my God. There's a million things, right? They they have like these specific tasks that they look for, and based on that, they will say uh, how likely this layer thinks that this is a cat, and then they'll pass this on to the next layer, and on and on and on like this. And the sum of all this, I guess, is uh, of all this processing by all these layers. The outcome is: is this a cat? Yes or no? With a high degree of certainty. And then, uh, of course, there's uh, confirmation or training that can be done by software or humans to continue to improve it until we get really close. And that's done by uh, not processing, you know, a few hundred images. It's usually, and depending on the problem, but usually hundreds of thousands at least of images, if not millions or, you know, hundreds of millions of images to gain that sense of certainty that we know exactly what we're doing. So it's, it's a, a field that's accelerating really fast. The research is not just image recognition is one example. And uh, obviously, you know, image recognition is at the, the front of the uh, self-driving car. I mean, this, this is something that's fantastic that's happening now. And it wouldn't be possible if we weren't able to process all these images really fast to determine what's going on around the car. Is the car driving in the right lane? 
Is it obeying the speed limit? Is it stopping when it's time to stop? Does it recognize a human? Does it recognize a tree and so forth? So th these are, um, uh, you know, this research is really important, the advancement of technologies like self-driving cars. And you have the same thing with um, speech recognition as well. So the ability to recognize natural language and understand the meaning of it uh, relies on the same research and the, well, the same type of research. Um, and Microsoft is one of the leaders in this. I was just at a summit with them two weeks ago, or yeah, I think two, last week actually. And they had some of their scientists um, showcasing the work they do at processing natural language for translation. So, and it's surprisingly good. In other words, uh, two people with devices just like Star Trek's Universal Translator, and it works very well. In fact, they had three people with three different languages on the stage speaking to each other about random things. With uh, it was perfect. It was amazing. Anyway, so just to say that you know the uh, deep learning and uh, these fields of research are really important, and they're going to be the source of uh, major changes in our society including in the work that we do in, in marketing and advertising, of course. So next slide. So how, how does it apply uh, to uh, marketing more specifically? Um, there's many uh, applications. I know that uh, some companies uh, for, for a long time now do what's called a sentiment analysis on social media, for example. It's trying to understand what's being said out there is it positive or negative and and so on and uh, of course uh, this when there's a lot of data flowing the the detection becomes better and better so obviously the companies that did sentiment analysis like 10 years ago uh, used probably fairly rudimentary techniques but I would guess that today they're using or they're at least testing machine learning to try to improve you know, their ability to detect like sentiment um, also looking for images, for example, like uh, companies that make products to recognize that people are taking pictures of their products and sharing them and so forth is another application. So image recognition, as we all know, is, is good. We just talked about it, but also we can all see a use of it with uh, photo management software uh, in your phones or in, uh, I don't know if it's iTunes or what, but I have all this stuff in Google Photos and there's many applications like that where you train them to detect a face, for example. So they'll recognize that, you know, this is my son, Anders, for example. So I have pictures of him when he was a little baby, pictures as he grew up a little bit. And uh, after a little while, you know, they start recognizing him, no matter how old he was or what angle the picture is taken at, and they're, you know, relatively accurate. <laughs> so this, you know, this sort of facial recognition software, image recognition uh, algorithms and so forth are, are, you know, you can imagine tons of applications for, for MarTech, for marketing uh, technology. And, uh, but, you know, for, for us, like we, we do research there, but it's very focused uh, at the moment. It's very focused on controlling the money. Uh, so budget allocation, bid control, controlling bid modifiers and things like that. Uh, but, you know, you can imagine in the future, we're already looking at doing things like that, like recognizing keywords and how they apply to specific verticals, what kind of success you, you may, may or may not expect, uh, audience targeting, so uh, helping or trying to imagine a situation where we can control the audience and help you, you know, sort of hone in on the correct one based on your uh, goals, placement uh, management, so discovering the right placements where you should be and where you should not be. So all these things can be done based on large data sets, in theory anyway. So th these are areas of, of course, of research for, for us and I'm sure many, many other companies like Google and Facebook, uh, because you know, that's, it's meaningful. If you can help the marketer make the right decision, uh, I think we're, we're gonna help the world uh, be a better place, especially for the small guys who, you know, they may not be marketing experts, but they still need to survive in business. So being able to provide technology that uh, does a lot of the work for you uh, effectively, for me, is something that, that is uh, inspiring. It's something that, that drives us every day. Next slide.
So like I alluded to earlier, you know, some of the impacts of doing a good job controlling bids and so forth is, uh, of course, uh, you know, if you're like a reseller or an agency, your customers will uh, feel the impact of better results. And so for you, it means that they, they stay with you longer. Uh, so the, the impact uh, that we see, uh, especially in the reseller segment, so these are companies that serve very small uh, companies, is about three and a half months longer lifetime. This is across tens of thousands of accounts where we see that those customers who apply uh, uh, bid and budget management algorithms to their customer set just have better results and customers stay longer. So then their business uh, benefits from it because they make a little bit more money. Uh, next slide. Yeah, so that's that's basically what I just said. You know, you benefit, you get better campaign performance. Uh, of course, we can automate some workflows to improve uh, operating efficiencies, and uh, which decreases your cost of operation, uh, increases your customer satisfaction, the lifetime value, of course, the lower lower churn rates, which go with your lo longer lifetime. So the impact in terms of performance, uh, if we look specifically at performance, uh, hitting budget targets, depending on whether you're using AdWords or Bing, um, you're much more likely to hit your budget target than if you're trying to do it on your own. Uh, two and a half times more likely for AdWords, seven times more likely on Bing ads. Uh, and then, um, oh, hold on, the second, anyway, never mind that second uh, metric, I think. And that's probably a mistake. All right, let's go to the next slide, please. Okay, that's it for me okay. for now. Okay, thanks, Jeff. thanks a thanks a lot, Mark. So I'm going to talk about today some of the features that we can use in PPC that take advantage of machine learning. But before we jump into those uh, features, I want to talk to you a little bit about something called signals. So this is something that Google likes to reference, and they're kind of vague about it. They don't like to really reveal all the different data signals that are out there. But it is terminology we need to understand because as the world becomes more and more automated and we use machine learning more and more to drive our PPC forward, we do have to understand that there are these data signals that are out there. So if I could just digress for a second, uh, there's three things that I'm, I'm passionate about. I'm passionate about military history, baseball, and PPC. And when I was uh, thinking through the topic today, I realized that signals uh, really show up in a lot of these different uh, areas. So for example, uh, in the military, there's something called signals intelligence or a signals core. And the whole job of that group of the military is to collect all these different strands of data, uh, you know, millions and billions of uh, bits of data, they put it together, they paint a picture of the overall situation, and then they're trying to predict based off of that information of what the uh, opposing army or enemy might do. Uh, so this way, this information is uh, passed up to the decision makers up the chain of command so they can plot strategy and, and tactics and, and things of that nature. In baseball, there's something called Saber Metrics, which is a whole analytical way of looking at baseball. And again, it's charting every single pitch. It's charting every single hit. So you can paint a picture of what's going to happen when a certain pitcher is opposing a certain batter and predicting what the outcome is going to be. If you can learn signals like, uh, you know, 62% of the time, this player uh, will hit a ball to left field at night. Uh, that information might teach a pitcher, you know, I need to throw the ball, uh, you know, to the outside part of the plate to make sure he doesn't hit there, or vice versa. Uh, it might be learned that a pitcher likes to throw fastballs uh, in the fourth inning of, uh, of games when it's uh, 90 degrees or hotter. Uh, the, the batter then has that intelligence to know that this is probably coming, I need to adjust for it. And in PPC, it's all about the signals. So we get tons of information about how users are interacting in specific auctions related to the device they're on, the operating system they're on, 
the time of day, the day of the week. All this information is used by Google and, and a lot of other uh, uh, PPC platforms where they can make a prediction. They could say, uh, I believe, based on the information that I have, that this particular auction is more likely to convert or it's less likely to convert or it's more likely to drive engagement or more likely to drive attribution and built into uh, – a lot of bidding systems is all this predictive data where you can then uh, you can then uh, have the machine plan bids to, to position you correctly. So with that said, we're going to take a look at uh, some Google bidding strategies. So the ones that we're going to focus on today are enhanced CPC, uh, target CPA, and we're going to spend a little bit of time on target ROAS. Uh, those three bidding features are actually called Google's smart bidding technology, or they might call it their, their smart bidding package. So enhanced CPC, it splits the difference between manual bidding and using the machine to help enhance your bids to put you in a better position. So the way enhanced CPC works, and you can use it on search and display, you can use it by device, uh, you set your bid. So, for example, you may set your bid to be a dollar. What Google will then do is it will then study uh, the landscape, and then based on the probability of conversion, Google will actually take your bid and boost it up to 30%, or depending on the probability of non-conversion, will actually drop your bid up to 100%. So you're protected either way. The machine can do a deeper crawl into what's going on behind the scenes to be able to better position you than if you were just bidding manually. And you're also protected because Google will bid down. So it mitigates the, the uh, chance that you're just going to spend a lot of money because you're overbidding if you don't convert. Uh, uh, enhanced CPC bidding can be used by device, as I uh, just said a moment ago. So, for example, let's just say, you know, you bid that dollar, but then you put a 30% bid modifier in place because uh, your mobile device has either good engagement or good conversion. What uh, enhanced CPC bidding will do is they will look at that auction. They will also take a look at the, that device that you're on and make a decision of whether to boost your bids up or down. So you could have, uh, you know, a dollar thirty plus another thirty percent uh, to put you in that max position to uh, to convert if you do particularly well on a particular device. So eCPC, the long and short of it is. It gives you a lot of control if you want to have that control over bidding, but it also allows you to take advantage of machine learning to give an extra boost to your bids. This is just a recap slide, uh, you know, just for your information if you decide to download the deck uh, later on. Uh, one thing that you will need to make sure is that conversion tracking must be installed. So. Google may not come right out and say it, but Google uses your conversion tracking data and everybody else's conversion tracking data in the AdWords ecosystem, just like Bing will use it or Facebook will use it. And this is how they drive their machine. This is how they understand the probability of conversion. It's based on real data that's out there. The next area that we're going to discuss is target CPA bidding. So if you want to have a fully automated uh, bidding structure and you want to let the machine help you to decide what the best bids would be, this would be uh, a recommendation that I would make to use this feature. So the way that it works is you would just simply enter in the target CPA that you're you're desiring. So for instance, maybe you're a lead generation advertiser and you're looking to spend no more than $100 a lead. You can simply just enter in uh, your CPA target of $100, and then uh, Google will go out and look for auctions uh, that they think that are most likely to convert at that uh, uh, cost per acquisition. Uh, I have found in my experience the target CPA is actually uh, very counterintuitive. Uh, what I recommend that you do is set 
a target that's actually higher than what you're you're looking for. So for instance, if you're looking for a hundred dollar CPA, I would recommend setting your target at $125 or $150 a lead. What you're actually doing is you're giving the system more room to run. And I have found this to be fairly common outside of Google as well in, in systems like Acquisio or systems like Optimizer. Uh, when you give that room to run, the machine has more time to learn and it gives gives more time to test. And what what you're doing is you're giving more space to find the sweet spot and when you find the sweet spot and you start generating more conversions than you would manually, your target CPA tends to settle right in. Uh, I found consequently when I use target CPA and I over restrict it, you know, if I say, you know, I want that hundred dollars and I put it at a hundred dollars on the nose, or I say, you know, I'm going to be a little bit conservative and I'm going to uh, put a target of maybe $95. I actually find that my target, my, my real CPA is actually much higher because I'm not giving the system as much room to explore uh, what's out there. Uh, not all auctions are created similar. Some auctions are more expensive than others to get into, and they're more expensive precisely because they're higher quality. So I would rather give the system room to run to get into those higher quality auctions and let the sheer volume of conversions that I'm getting actually bring my CPA down to something that, that's in the range that I can accept. And just like with enhanced uh, CPC bidding, you can use this on search and display. And you can still use it by device. So really, the uh, the key takeaway with target CPA, you know, the thing to know is there's a lot of complex algorithm rhythms that are going on, crunching tons and tons of data in real time. This is data that we don't necessarily have access to, and the human brain can't process the information, you know, that fast, like Mark said when he was explaining AI, and, and we surely couldn't do it fast enough to make some of the real-time decisions we need to do in order to, to manage our accounts. And uh, the other thing to understand with machine learning, it what Google is doing or what the bid management systems are doing, they're, they're doing predictive bidding. The more information that the system has, the more educated decision that it can make. If we're trying to do fully automated bidding and we don't have a lot of conversion data, it's going to take a while for the system to learn, so you're going to need to be patient. You know, you can start off with a very high CPA because the system is still trying to find that sweet spot. So uh, keep that in mind when you're going down the target CPA bidding road. Uh, I would suggest letting the system run for at least two weeks. I would also uh, ideally like to get 30 to 40 conversions uh, for the system to really learn. Uh, the way that I would compensate for this is if you're using manual bidding, I would uh, make sure I have a lower budget on the campaign so this way while the system is going through its ups and downs and peaks and valleys that there's uh, there's some sort of control in place so you're not overspending. And finally, uh, just like uh, ECPC, you'll need to have conversion tracking in place. And then finally, we'll touch, at least on bidding, on target ROAS. Works very similar to uh, target CPA bidding. You're essentially setting your you're setting a range to where you can get the best uh, ROAS possible. So instead of entering a target CPA and saying, I want $100 a lead, you can enter a target that might say, I want a 200% return. And then what the system is going to do, it's going to go out there and it's going to look for auctions that, that Google believes can drive, you know, that conversion, uh, bring that revenue in for you at that target ROAS. And I believe that uh, a lot of the same rules apply. Uh, I would be a little bit more liberal with uh, the ROAS target, again, to find that sweet spot and let the amount of conversions and the amount of revenue that you're driving, uh, you know, settle into a point to where you're actually uh, targeting your ROAS. You know, you want to be in the high quality auctions that are going to, you know, they're going to convert for you and, and drive that revenue for you. 
One thing that's not recommended, uh, although Google gives you the option to set bid limits for target ROAS, you are limiting your ability for the machine to optimize. If you're putting a manual governor in, uh, it's blocking a lot of the purpose of the, of the machine learning. So let, let the machine learn, let it do its thing, uh, because it's using all these real-time signals that we've been talking about, the time of day, browser, operating system, uh, uh, so much data is at the hands of, of Google that it can make a smart decision. Uh, we just need to remove ourselves uh, from that aspect of it. If we've set up good account structures and we have strong messaging or uh, we have strong shopping feeds with good quality product imaging and, and good attributes in our feeds, then we're putting ourselves in a position to win. Those are things that we can control very well up front is the strategy of, of how we want our outcome to, to, to develop. And we can let the, the bid management systems, we can let the, the search engines use the data and do what it does best is, is use machines to help us uh, you know, get to the results that we're looking for. So the next feature that I'm going to talk about is uh, not so much about bidding, but actually automating Google display campaigns. So smart display campaigns is actually an open beta. Uh, most of you will see it in your accounts. So what smart display campaigns do, uh, it actually takes your assets. So what you're doing is you're providing uh, images, you're providing some headline copy, you're providing uh, uh, some just some seed copy, uh, and Google is going to automatically optimize that for you. So there's a whole range of sites. The, the Google Display Network is, you know, tens if not hundreds of millions of sites at this point. Uh, advertisers or publishers take on all different shapes and sizes. So, you know, it's hard to have add images or add copy created for all those different images, image sizes. Google is automatically resizing and it's automatically optimizing your copy uh, to be able to give the most optimized message. So instead of us having to go through uh, a lot of iterations of ad copy, we can leave it to the machine to help us do all that. Uh, automatic targeting has taken place. So based on your campaign theme, uh, uh, Google will go out and look for targeting that's most related to your subject matter and put you in a place that uh, is going to be relevant. So the end result is that uh, potential customers are consuming content that's closely re related to what it is that you're trying to sell, and it just makes for a more natural fit. And uh, like I said, uh, you know, optimizing on the best performing uh, combination of images and text uh, you know, saves a lot of work. It allows you to focus more on the strategy of what you're you're trying to achieve with uh, GDN without getting caught as much in the weeds, uh, uh, especially considering GDN provides so much more data than search because there's so much more volume behind it that uh, Google can once again, you know, do those optimizations a lot faster than we could. So there are things to consider with smart display campaigns. So if you in the audience are even a little bit like me as a PPC professional, you're probably a control freak and it's hard to give up some control. Uh, you would be giving up manual bidding. So it would be on the target CPA. So you're, you're handing that over. In this instance with display campaigns, you're, you're giving up device targeting, so you're not going to specifically be putting modifiers on for, for uh, mobile or desktop. It's going to be automatically taken care of by Google, and you're giving up all manual targeting. You're not going to be physically placing uh, ads on sites yourself, uh, and uh, you're giving up the ad creation. Now, there's a big thing to consider here. If you're in a highly compliant industry or you have very strict brand specifications, give a lot of thought before going into uh, smart display campaigns because with Google optimizing, they're not going to know all those little nuances and you don't want your ad copy to be optimized into something that might convert well, but you find that you're saying something that's against uh, 
by regulation. And this is particularly important in industries like insurance or finance or education, uh, where there's actually regulators that are actually patrolling uh, search results and they're looking for ads that are uncompliant. So it, it's a risk reward and you, you do have to weigh that to make that decision if you want to go a more uh, automated route or if you feel that you need to go a manual route. So you know, this is something that you should spend uh, a considerable amount of time can, uh, you know, deciding what's best for you. So if you take a look at the uh, at this slide here, you'll see on the left hand uh, left hand side what our uh, ads look like on the GDN network up to about six eight months ago. Uh, these ads were pretty standard. They didn't really match all that well the look and feel of the site. So you really knew that it was an ad because it, it stuck out there. Uh, Google has moved to something called responsive text ads. Or, or I'm sorry, responsive ads. So whether it's a text ad or whether it's an image ad, uh, those ads will conform more to the look and feel of the site. And as you can see, uh, for example, the image of the, the, the hotel, uh, you know, it's much cleaner. It's, uh, you know, it feels more like content, uh, you know, same with the native ad than it does an ad. So what this does is, is it uh, allows for a lot more engagement because you feel like you're interacting with content. So those are the type of ads that are going to show up on the smart display campaigns and the type of ads that are used on GDN campaigns in general now. Some best practices to consider for smart display campaigns is uh, strategy and structure. What, what is it that you're trying to accomplish? Make sure that you really nail that down and have an understanding and put the right campaign structure in place. For instance, if you're selling shoes, uh, you're selling red shoes and you're selling blue shoes, you know, have a red shoes campaign, have a blue shoes campaign, have ad groups about the different types of shoes, whether they're heels or whether they're sneakers. Uh, because you're giving up all this control, the structure is really important uh, to telling Google uh, what sites to show up and what's relevant. The other thing that's really important is you've got to give the system time to learn. Uh, one of the uh, most important things we have to remember in PPC is to not do the knee-jerk reaction. When I was uh, fairly young in my career, I would get particularly spooked by GDN. Uh, you set a budget, you can burn through that budget in 30 minutes, and when you see that you haven't gotten any conversions, it's very easy just to bail on it. Uh, search is a lot more consistent and, and predictable. Uh, what you have to do is you, uh, you got to give it time to run. Let let the GDN learn. Let the system learn. So what I would suggest is once again when you're when you're setting up these campaigns and you're putting them live, put them on a low budget. You know, don't, don't expect it. You know, don't try to ramp it up to 100% right away. Let the system learn. See what your performance is feed it a little bit more budget and a little bit more, and then over time, you're going to collect the data uh, or your campaign's going to collect the data that it needs to be able to make all those optimizations. And then ultimately, when you start pulling down your smart display campaign reports, you're going to be able to have good solid data to make some decisions on what some of your, you know, changes need to be made, you know, to add copy and, and in your assets and whatnot. And then the important thing is to make sure that you're doing incremental changes. Uh, when, you're, when you're working with machine learning and you do wholesale changes, the system has to learn all over again. And you can essentially put yourself back at square one. So make sure there, there's smaller changes and, and tweaks. And, and, and use the system to just con to continually iterate. And then over time, you're going to get some pretty great results. Uh, just in terms of setting up smart display campaigns, uh, you should see the beta. Uh, you, you just click on uh, display or the display tab in, in the interface. Uh, you just click on create a smart campaign, choose your location, and choose your language. Enter your target CPA. That's going to be your prime bid strategy. And then enter your budget. 
and then you're pretty much all set. You, you know, you've loaded in your assets at that point, and then you're ready to run a display uh, uh, or a smart display campaign. So the final thing we're going to talk about is ad rotation. So one thing that we tend to focus on when we're doing uh, ad testing or, or, or ad copy is we focus on the message. And the message is really important because that's what resonates. But especially for the people in the audience that uh, may not be quite as experienced, have you ever thought about the power that ad rotation settings just in and of themselves can do to drive your performance forward? So Google gives you the ability through rotate indefinitely to do a completely manual test. It'll split your impressions 50-50, uh, and you can make a call with the data that you have on hand of what's the best ad to, to, uh, to be a winner and then iterate off of that. But and then uh, rotate evenly allows you to do that for 90 days, then the machine will optimize. But the real power, if you really want to use the machine to drive your ad rotation forward and really get some cool testing, is you can use the system to optimize for clicks or optimize for conversions. So once again, those signals that we've been talking about, Google is going to use those. And they're going to use all those signals at the time that an auction uh, fires, and uh, they're going to make a predictive analysis of what's the best ad, and then uh, show that ad. And then over time, uh, Google's going to pick the winner for you. It's going to decide based on whether you've optimized for clicks of whether uh, ad A or ad B should primarily show, and same for conversions. You might see some anomalies you might see an ad that actually has less data uh, or even an ad that appears to be losing based on the data that we see and don't actually choose that to be the winner. My advice to you would be to have faith because there's a lot of data that Google's crunching behind the scenes that we don't see. You know, we can pull down data like clicks and impressions and click-through rate and conversions, and we can uh, aggregate that data and say, I have a winner, I have a loser, but we don't know what operating system are they on, what time of day is it, uh, uh, what device are they on, the, the, the same things that we're talking about. Google can, can have an insight into all of these things and be able to make that decision for you. So what you should do is have some faith in the machine. I believe in, in trust and verify over time if you truly feel that those results aren't holding up and you need to switch to something that's more manual, then, then go ahead and do so. So ad rotation uh, provides great split testing uh, opportunities. You can test manual in an ad group for a while and then put it on something like optimized clicks and see how your performance is or conversions. Or you can test maybe having your uh, ad rotation for a period of time on con uh, optimized for conversions versus clicks and see what gets you better performance. You might find, for instance, that, that you're optimizing for conversions and you're reducing the amount of traffic you're getting. So maybe you're getting a higher conversion rate, but maybe you're not getting the, uh, the most possible conversions. Maybe uh, optimizing for clicks uh, drives just more traffic, and that traffic is high quality, and, and you're driving more total conversions. So keep ad rotation uh, settings is something in your pocket to test along with just uh, uh, your uh, – uh, ad copy itself, because you're going to learn a lot about traffic uh, insights. You're going to really learn on some of these settings what brings you the highest quality traffic. And Mark, I'll pass it back over to you. Yeah, that was great. Just so much stuff going on, and this is just Google, and Bing has their own initiatives, and Facebook, and, you know, uh, I mean, there's, there's a lot going on, lots of testing, and, um, you know, if you think of companies that are sitting on a lot of data, you know, I can't imagine the, the in our space, anyway, companies larger than Google and then Facebook, you know, they, 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 they can make, uh, you know, they have the opportunity to innovate and help us uh, succeed. 
even more, you know, than ever before. So it'd be fantastic, impressive. I guess it's impressive to see where they've, how far they've come. And um, for me, the uh, smart display campaigns are a sign of things to come. I really believe that uh, this is the direction that uh, that marketing technology is going to take is to go beyond uh, just controlling the money, which is still a difficult problem, but uh, into uh, more, right? So creative, cr like managing creative placement, where's the ads going to be shown and why, not necessarily why, but the, where do we put them uh, in, in order to generate maximum results? Writing ads, you know, computers, uh, machine learning technologies, writing uh, strange but interesting movie scripts and books <laughs> today and symphonies and so forth right they're uh, getting creative so of course it's early day but I can imagine that it you know a few years from now uh, you will have technology that writes pretty good ads from scratch <laughs> I believe that and uh, especially true for uh, smaller advertisers who don't have Restrictions are not in a like highly regulated industry or who are not uh, so brand sensitive. Uh, there will be a lot of benefits for those those guys there. Selecting keywords is another area, like picking the right keywords based on uh, observed performance, like across you know millions of other uh, campaigns that are running. So it's just, all these things are areas of research that I'm sure will bear uh, fruit over the next few years and where uh, you know clearly that means our, our the work of, uh, of managing performance campaigns is going to change for everyone you know the where we're going to focus our time is going to be more and more uh, on the things that are better left to humans and uh, the technology will spend uh, will just improve everything tremendously the quality of the, the results that we get and our ability to, to right size the budget, you know, so that uh, nobody's wasting money. Anyway, so I think I think we're uh, there's a bright future for uh, AI in marketing technology, and uh, of course, uh, you know, like I want to be a part of it. So, if uh, I know that many of you are customers and so forth, but you know, we look forward to your feedback on the things we're doing. Some ideas you may have are very welcome. And um, with that, I think uh, that. That's it for this uh, the content of the the webinar. I believe we have a few questions and we have a few offers. Uh, maybe we start with that. Um, so there's four offers. Uh, you can get uh, ten percent off a one year license of the Quizio's technology, and uh, you can get a demo uh, today. So you can ask for that. You can get, of course, an account analysis by the team at uh, Hennepin. So they'll look at your account uh, for free for accounts that spend at least fifteen thousand dollars per month. Uh, you can have for both, or of course, uh, no thanks if you don't need this. We'll let everybody answer. Yep. Then we'll go. Ahead. So Mark, yeah, so yes, so Mark, uh, you know, great content today. You know, one thing that I think about a lot is AI and machine learning is becoming such a bigger piece, and it's really taking off. Is how does this change the? Uh, PPC professional, what are some of the skills you think that that uh, PPC professionals are going to need over the, the next few years versus what they needed the last few years? Yeah, I think the uh, Excel jockey is going to have to find a new option. <laughs> That's what I think. Uh, you know, I mean, unfortunately, today it's still important to be able to, to download data, pour through it, try to find trends and so forth. But, uh, you know, if you use the right tools, I don't think that's uh, always that important. So anyway, and, and over time, that, you know, there's always going to be a, a, use, a use case for this. But I think that specific skill is going gonna, is gonna to be uh, not necessary. Uh, I believe it's going to be the creative part, being able to come up with great campaign strategies and, to, and, and great uh, uh, creative skills to be able to, like, capture attention and um and uh, generate the uh, emotion you know with the people who are exposed to your ads and get them to react it's not, these are human things that are going to be very difficult for machines to to execute on i believe so i'd say I, that's you know i'd say that's that's how it's going to impact the field it's the the type of work we're going to do is going to change there's, there's going to be work for a little you know, there's always going to be work for for advertising experts but 
the type of work we do is going to be different. The being a robot, you know, doing things uh, by following a specific process, like, okay, first do this, click this, do that, like that. We often hire uh, young people out of school to do, where they're just following a script. That's gone. Should, I mean, that should be gone already, but maybe not, but that, that will go away. And I believe the uh, the creative piece, uh, the things that require strategy and so forth, they're going to be more and more important. Yep, I'm in full agreement with you, and that's what you know. That's what we're seeing here in Hennepin. That it's going to be much more strategic, and it's going to be much more, uh, you know, much less, uh, um, you know, just doing that that robot work because a lot of that work is going to be able to be taken care of by machine learning. I agree. So we got a few questions, and we have a few okay. minutes. Maybe we'll go through them. If you don't mind, I'll read them. I have them in front of me. Is that good? Mm -hmm. All sure. Right. So the first one applies to smart display campaigns. The question is, can we exclude uh, demographics like age, gender? Uh, maybe can we exclude placements? Can we exclude, like, are there exclusions available? Sure. So my understanding of it, and because it's still in, in an open beta, there's probably going to be more iterations to it. But that stuff is left to the machine to make that decision. So, uh, and, and I would think if you make those upfront exclusions, you're you're defeating the purpose to a degree of the smart campaign. I would let the system run and find out truly based off of data what's working, what's not working, and uh, let Google decide whether it needs to exclude a particular uh, 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 demographic or age group. Yeah. I think it goes back to the trust. Like we see this all the time. The customers use, um, you know, trying to yield control to algorithms or to tech, and they're not comfortable doing that. I think your approach of um, assigning small budgets, step by step, mm -hmm. try it, you know, that's the right way to go. Uh, and give it, letting the machines make some decisions and, <laughs> and let them learn from their own mistakes. Um, I, I agree with you. This is this is the the right approach. So. Good. Uh, I got another question. We have another question. How much time is considered uh, like sufficient or good duration to run such a task to let uh, the machine learn with uh, smart display campaigns? Sure. So Google is recommending letting at least run two weeks. Uh, and uh, what I think is the most the more important metric is uh, trying to acquire at least 50 conversions. So that would be the minimum baseline for Google to have, you know, hard data to, to make those optimizations. So, you know, in that beginning phase when, when you're learning, you're depending a lot on uh, system-wide metrics and system-wide benchmarks, and then you're trying to match against that. But as you start getting up to 50 or 75 conversions and the system can look at your account and your performance, then it can really hone in, but it requires being patient, you know, and depending on the size of your budget and how aggressive you're willing to be, that could take a few months or that could take a couple of weeks. It, it really all depends, but that, those would be the minimum baselines. All right, cool. Got another question, I think for me, so I'll read it and then I'll, uh, I'll think for two seconds and then I'll answer. <laughs> It says, uh, rotate indefinitely results in an impression share that's not 50-50. This is mainly due to the fact that Google sends both ads 50-50 to the auction, but it could mean that ads impression share 20-80, for example, based on ad quality. How do you cope with this while ad copy testing? Well, you need to make sure you have sufficient data on all your samples. So if you have three subjects in your sample or four, sub four subjects, meaning four ads running, you want to make sure that the ad that has the least uh, impressions gave you enough that you've seen enough that it's a sufficient size sample uh, that you can, that the machine can make a decision whether or not it's a good ad. So we have no more questions. We're coming close to the end anyway. There's only like five minutes left. Um, mm -hmm. So maybe uh, just to finish, uh, we have one final slide for uh, contact information. Um, mm -hmm. It's uh, you can contact uh, uh, Hennepin directly at uh, marketing at hennepinmarketing.com and you can contact me mark at acquisit.com I promise I will forward your email to the right people or I'll answer your question uh, really rapidly with that I'll leave it to you to conclude 
Great. Well, I thank everyone for attending our webinar today. It's, uh, I think that we had some uh, great content, and I think uh, uh, the audience will walk away with some actionable insights that they can start applying in their accounts. So, uh, you know, continue to uh, send us questions, you know, through these uh, email addresses, and we'll be glad to help you out. Well, Mark, it's been a pleasure. Yes, always is a pleasure. All right, take care, everybody. All right, thank you.